Well, good morning. Boy, y'all sound a little bit slow this morning. What's that all about? Let's try that again. Good morning. Good morning. There we go. I know it's no fun moving that clock forward. I, I struggle with that a little bit myself. That means i got to get up earlier, and I don't like to get up early as it is, so that makes it a little tough. Hey, thank the band here today. Thank you, Terry, jumping in there, and all y'all guys. David, we appreciate y'all. We uh, Nick's out today, and uh, it's pretty cool where these guys can just fall in one behind the other and get it done, so we really appreciate it. There you go. We appreciate that. You know, I performed a wedding yesterday. Uh, it was a really good wedding, too. It was fun. It was uh, my niece's wedding. It was down in Athens at the Athens Fish Hatchery. Now, that's perfect for me as a fisherman, man, to get to go and uh, do a wedding and enjoy the the area down there. If you've never been there, it's a, man, it's a really neat, it's a giant aquarium where they breed fish, you know. They, they get a lot of these large fish there, and they have all kinds, so uh, fish from Texas, so it's a neat place to visit. But yesterday, the weather was just, oh, it was just really nice. Uh, uh, it's down in the pine trees, a beautiful layout. There are little ponds everywhere. In fact, where we did the wedding underneath a little uh, out building there, it was pretty cool. There's a pond right behind us, and I told him, I said, you know, I'm trying to do the wedding, and you're trying to concentrate on what you're going to say, but you keep hearing these fish jump in this pond behind you, and you're thinking, where's my fishing rod? So uh, it, it had its good things about it, and it, it kind of had some bad there, but... Uh, but I did realize something yesterday. It seems that no matter where you go these days, whether you're up here in the big cities or you're down in small towns or where you're at, someone is always questioning what the Bible says. I, I ran in this yesterday. I was told that uh, all the things in the Bible and what it says does not apply today. All the things in the Bible and what it says doesn't apply today. They said that everyone can't live up to what is expected from church people. Church people. I thought, now wait a minute. We can't live up to what is expected from church people? Church people didn't write the Bible. That's God's words. And as I continue to speak with these people and talk to them about this, what it is is, like many, they don't agree with everything it says. And the reason they don't agree with everything it says because it doesn't fit what they want to do. Or it doesn't fit their lifestyle. So it's real easy to not agree with the Bible because it doesn't fit our lifestyle. I told them, as I was uh, told once before, then we should go through the Bible and every piece of Scripture in there that doesn't fit or we don't agree with, we just need to tear it out. Throw it away. Would be a thin Bible, you're right. Because in some way, they're trying to justify their lifestyle. I call that conviction, even if you don't know the Bible. If you have your Bible today, would you hold it up? Hold it up, show me your Bible. Called you out today, didn't I? Oh, thank you. And if you don't own a Bible, I would suggest that you get one because I don't want you just taking my word for it on what's inside. Also, if you're in need of a Bible, you can see me or one of the lay pastors here, and after this service, we'll be glad to assist you in getting one. Uh, everyone should have their own Bible. The Bible is actually... Uh, one of the best tools that you could, you could own. You know, guys, we have all these tools we work with. Ladies, you have all these utensils and tools in your kitchen. But the Bible is the number one tool that we should have in our home, maybe even in our vehicle, everywhere we go, because it's the Word of God. The Christian Bible today is under attack from many different special interest groups and some government sources today is under attack the devil hates this book we know that he hates this book and he would destroy it in a minute if he could some despise the bible 
and others, they just deny it. I thought that was only, that that didn't hold as true maybe so much in small towns. You know, especially out in the outer reaches of the cities and stuff. I thought that was growing a growing trend in our big major cities. That the small towns were the last ones to hang on to those Christian values. I'm still living in Mayberry, y'all. Because it's not that way anymore. There's so many changes going on that it's it's pretty disturbing, you know. It it I was telling the guys it bothered me so much because you're seeing a loss more and more of that. It's uh it's kind of a uh hurt your heart a lot to see that going on. Maybe not so much for me ten years ago before I came a Christian. I might have been right in there with them. Did have morals, did have values. Nowadays a lot of people don't have morals and don't have any values. But one thing's for sure. God's still on the throne, amen? So we've got something to hang on to. You know, some people just want to distort the Bible. They have a warped, misused, and abused sense of what the Bible's all about. The sad part is, is they're teaching that to the next generation coming up. You know, I'm one of the baby boomers. I don't know if you're X, Y, Z, or whatever generation you're in, but I feel like the last generation, the baby boomers, were the last true generation that was instilling in their, their kids totally what Christ was about. You know, it's been a big change since that time, and we keep seeing it going further and further away. As Christians, it's up to us to make those changes. You know, you cannot... I always say I can't fix the whole world, but I can fix my little piece of it. And that's what's required of me to do. We want to fix the whole world. We want to change things. So once again, our kids can go out and play and not have to be worried about. We'd like to go back to that. We'd like it where we don't have to worry about being robbed everywhere we go, everything we do, or murdered. No, but it's in society. And as you see, the minute we took Christ out of our schools even Christ out of our government and out of our homes, things have started to change. Big, big changes. We're seeing things going on that my parents would say said when I had that long hair and listened to that devil music that I listened to. Right then, I understood that they saw those changes in us and they were just trying to keep us you know, pretty steady ourselves. They thought the world's going to hell in a handbag, you know, just in a minute. And that's kind of how we feel now. But I believe all of you that were part of that baby boomer generation, you would agree with me that nothing has ever changed in society as much as it has in these days and times. Some people even say we're in the end times. That, get ready, because Jesus is coming back. You know, somehow this is all going to get cleaned up. Somehow this is all going to have to be taken care of. You know, how much will God actually take from this world before he does something about it? Well, it's a learning experience. But the best part of it is, as Christians here today, it starts with us. And it starts with Christians all over the world. One thing that we see is we got a lot of people in little bitty groups with big mouths, and they're speaking out. And we've got this giant Christian coalition that's sitting back and keeping their mouth shut instead of speaking what you think. Because today it's not politically correct to go against anything that anybody says. If you don't fit that mold, then you're going to be persecuted because of your beliefs. And that makes it really tough for us to go through society. That makes it really tough, tough for us to instill in our children and our grandchildren that this is the way it needs to be. It is an awful feeling to think about what our children and our grandchildren are going to deal with in the years to come if something doesn't change. It's not going to get any better. It's going to get ugly unless the changes start with us. We're being told that the Bible doesn't hold true in today's society. 
It really doesn't hold true. And it's out of date. Many things in the Bible do not even apply today. So it's so out of date. It has been said that the Bible is just a book of stories. It's a book of stories that were made up to scare people into believing it. I've heard that. I've read that, that that's what the Bible's all about. It's just to scare people. I also read where the Bible was a love story. was a love story. A bunch of love stories. Because God loved us that much that he chose to give us this book to help us walk through life. John 1 tells us, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So that confirms it to us. So do we just believe that? If you believe in God, yes, you do. It is believed by some that the greatest enemy of the Bible is so-called Christians who simply ignore or disregard what the Bible says. They only give it a lot of lip service. They talk about it. They talk about how everybody's supposed to do everything in the Bible, how we're supposed to go by this, but they don't live up to it. They don't follow what it is. You know, when Moses came down with the Ten Commandments, and I can't find anywhere in the Bible because I looked, I can't find anywhere where it says, these are the Ten Commandments that God suggested that we do. From what I understand, this is what God commanded us to do. But nowadays society thinks that's just a suggestion. Many Christians are starting to see it that way, that that's just a suggestion. Truth and conviction is the one thing that keeps the true Christian going. Truth and conviction. We can take hold that the Bible is of truth, and what we read in the Bible as Christians, it convicts us to live and follow God's commands. Do we always do that? No. Do we fall down? Yes. Does the Bible tell us that we're not always going to follow it and we're going to fall down? Yes, it tells us that's going to happen. But even when that happens, we still believe, amen? And you know, even when we mess up, even when we get out there and we do something that God doesn't like, even when we're down as low as we can get and we're mad at God and we're not talking to God, we're not speaking to God because we're mad or we messed up and we don't want to speak to God, do you know He still loves you and He's still speaking to you? He doesn't stop all that because his word holds true. Feelings come, for, come and go. We know that. If we have feelings about certain things, they come and go. But one thing that we do know, feelings aren't based on truth. Truth is a completely different way to look at it. Our feelings can come and go, but God's word never changes. Never changes. We may feel different about certain things. Scripture in the Bible, we may feel differently about what it's telling us to do. But God's Word doesn't change. It's the same today, tomorrow, and yesterday. There are four things that shows why the Bible is so important to us. Four things that I'd like to cover with you. Number one, your salvation depends on understanding the gospel message of the Bible. Your salvation depends on that. Your assurance depends on resting in the truth of the Bible. Your spiritual growth depends on living by the principles of the Bible. And your power in witness depends on the confidence you have in the Word of God. If you don't have confidence in the Word of God, if you don't believe what you're reading, then how can you be a witness for someone else? Someone else. I said last week, you may be the only Bible that some people ever read your life. They may never pick that book up, but when they look at you, they can read the Bible through you because you're a living example of what God tells us we need to be. Because of all this, you must believe the Bible is the true Word of God. 
the true word of God. John 10, 27 says, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. My sheep listen to my voice, and they follow me. The Bible is shown to be the word of God because of scientific accuracy. And when I got to reading this, I thought, wait a minute, now we're going to cross science into this, and we know most scientists have worked really, really hard to disprove the Bible. They really want to do whatever it takes to disprove the Bible. But all this time, that has not happened. And I don't believe at any time in my belief that that's going to happen. But so I read about this, and once again, it says the Bible is shown to be the Word of God because of its scientific accuracy. It is common for people to assume that there must be scientific errors in the Bible. And they've tried to prove that. They want to prove that some of the scriptures, some of the things that went on in the Bible, there are a bunch of errors in there. Because normally, when in science, they wind up with a lot of errors when they're, doing, when they're working with science. So most often, those who claim scientific errors, they don't understand two things. There are two things they don't understand at all when they start talking about these scientific uh, errors in the Bible. The two things they don't understand, number one is science, and number two is the Bible. They don't understand either one, or they wouldn't be saying that. You know, those who do understand science, and many of you may, will admit that there's one continual state of flux, and that is constantly changing. Things are constantly changing in science. I mean, there's no way to deny that. It goes on and on. They accept that the science of yesterday is not the science of today. Rather, there's a lot of things that's changed in science since the, the past years, and it's completely different today. It has been estimated that in the, li that in the library in Paris has three and a half miles of books on science. Three and a half miles of books on science. And most every one of those books today are obsolete. Most every one of those books are obsolete. So we know all the changes that took place is to do with science. In 1861, the French Academy of Science wrote a pamphlet stating there were 51 scientific facts that proved the Bible was not true. Today, today there is not a reputable scientist on earth that believes, that believes one of those 51 so-called truths are facts. Rather, what they believed back then, the 51 they believed back then, even top-notch scientists today don't believe those 51 as fact anymore. That's a change. Complete change in the science of it. The point is, science is changing. But God's Word does not change. One of the most scientific facts and. uh I think you'll agree is true today is our earth is suspended in space. Do y'all believe that? I guess if uh, we've got pictures from outer space, we understand that our earth is suspended in space. And we could all agree on that. But ancient cultures, they, did not all, they didn't always know this. Did not know that at all. The ancient Egyptians used to believe that the earth was supported on pillars that the earth was supported on pillars. Found that pretty cool. This is even better. The Greeks believed the world was carried on the back of a giant whose name was Atlas. wonder how we got the Atlas. But they believed that. And the Hindus believed something even more ridiculous. They believed the earth was resting on the backs of gigantic elephants. Yeah, that's right. Then someone said, if that was true, then what are the elephants standing on? Uh-oh. We're back to science again, aren't we? The answer was pretty cool. It says the answer was the elephants are standing on the back of a giant turtle. They call it a tortoise, but I simplified it. But then someone asked, what's the turtle standing on? Oh, my gosh, we're getting deep now, aren't we? Y'all might want to write this down. <laughs> The reply was, the turtle was standing on the back of a huge, cold serpent. But when asked what the serpent was on, 
The conclusion was that the serpent was swimming around in a great cosmic sea. That was the science of that day. That was what people believed. We've come so far. So, so far. When we look at the Word of God in the Bible, we don't don't find any of that mythology in there at all. It's not in the Bible. In Job 26, Job spoke of the Lord by saying, He spreads out northern skies over empty space. He suspends the earth over nothing. In the Bible. And Job is perhaps the oldest piece of literature known to man. So how did Job know the earth is suspended in space? How would he know that? Job could only know that through divine, what? That divine inspiration. is the only way he could know that. Because science didn't allow that. The Bible says in 2 Timothy that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Let's turn there. Let's go to 2 Timothy. We're going to uh, chapter 3, beginning at verse 16. Second Timothy, chapter 3, beginning at verse 16. <coughs> Excuse me. It says, All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of I get, I, I get, don't have my glass on. Servant of God may thoroughly equip, may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So right here it tells us, without a doubt, that Scripture is good for just about everything. And Job knew this. Job Job knew this long before time, long before time. So Job, for you know. Job knew things that scientists in that day could not have known. That what he knew had to be given by God. Strictly from God. We also take for granted that the earth was round. Do we not do that? We take for granted that the earth is round. Do we know this by natural observation? If we were just here and didn't have any pictures from outer space or anything, would we know that? Not at all, we wouldn't know that. You've seen pictures from outer space, though. So... And maybe you've traveled around the world. So you take it for granted the earth's round. We know that. Remember how people uh, warned Columbus in 1492? Remember how they told him he'd better be careful because he might just sail right off the edge of the earth? Even as late as 1492, people did not know the earth was round. Think about that. As late as 1492, people still believed the world was flat. Yet Isaiah, in 750 B.C., said, He sits ethroned above the circle of the earth. You can find that in Isaiah 40, 22. He knew 750 years before Christ that the earth was round. How would he know this? They knew, both men knew, I'm sure I said that right, yeah, both men knew because holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. They didn't make this stuff up. They were being inspired by God, not by their selves. Turn with me to uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning at verse 21. Second Peter, verse one, beginning at uh, I'm sorry, chapter one, beginning at verse twenty-one. It says for prophecy never had its origins in the human will, but prophets through human spoke from God as they were car- carried along by the Holy Spirit. Sorry, I messed that up. I can't even hardly see it. Basically, the Holy Spirit was in these men. Otherwise, how would, because of what the science was in that day, how would these men know all this? Because the Word of God. The Word of God. And this is just a couple of areas of science where the Bible has been proven. We're barely touching the surface. 
barely touching the surface of the many scientific truths that are contained in the Bible. And it, that's why it's important for you to own a Bible and pick it up and read it. Because it's remarkable of the stuff that was known before today. It was remarkable that men would know things about this earth and what was going to take place long before it happened. We should be black glad that the Bible and modern science don't always agree. We should be thankful for that because science changes. The Bible never does. The Bible stays the same. There are so many people today that are trying to disprove the Bible. It still continue today. And because they're having such a difficult time, they instead decided that they can't disprove the Bible, so they want you to believe that the meanings of the scriptures in the Bible are not what Christians say they are, not what they're portrayed to be. They want to change your thinking. They can't disprove it, so they want to change your thinking that maybe none of that applies today. Maybe that was written a long time ago, and it just doesn't fit today's society. That we need to start making changes so it'll fit. That we need to become politically correct in everything we do, whether the Bible says so or not. The choices are, we have to stand our ground in our faith and believe that the Bible is the true word of God. Amen? Stand your ground and not run away when someone challenges it on that. Very easy for me yesterday to turn and walk away from someone that was so ignorant in the, in the truth of the Bible. But when I turn and run away, Satan wins. Amen? But when I stand my ground and say to them what I would want to, want to say to anyone that questions that, can you prove that? Can you disprove what I'm saying? Can you disprove God's word? We didn't talk much after that. And that's the way it should be, once again. Standing your ground, standing on your faith and God's word is your backing. That you believe the Bible is the truth, the whole truth. It's nothing but the truth, amen? The world actually wants us to uh, turn away from God. And people right here in this United States today are being persecuted because of their faith in Christ. And it's getting worse every day. But that doesn't mean we need to turn and run. Because we didn't come out of a group of people that God said turn and run. He didn't say deny my word. He said stand up for me. In 1836, there was a general named Santa Ana that also wanted people to give up their beliefs. About 250 Mexican and American settlers in San Antonio took refuge in an old Spanish mission called the Alamo. Many of you are familiar with that. That they were ordered to surrender. And if they didn't surrender, that once or if the fort, the mission was overrun or taken over, that everyone in there would be put to the sword and die. There would be no one spared. Travis, a man of God, answered to that demand by firing a cannonball over the enemy's head. And he stated, I will never surrender or retreat. Our flag still waves proudly from the walls. Victory or death, the Lord is on our side. And you know, Travis took his sword and he drew a line in the sand. And he asked men to step over the line showing a commitment to fight to the death for what they believed in. Even Jim Bowie, who was sick and lying on a cot, asked to be carried over that line because he believed in what he was fighting for. And also, 
these men, if you read very much into history, they were Christians. And they were willing to die for their country and their beliefs in God. After 13 days of heavy fighting and them keeping all their commitment to fight to the death, all but a handful were killed. But these men, these simple men, ignited the flames of passion for Texas freedom that allows us to be free today. We shouldn't be afraid. We shouldn't be afraid at all. Once again, as I said last week, the only thing we need to fear is God. Because everything else we fear is not necessary because God is with us. Amen? Just as these men were not afraid to take a stand for freedom, we should not be afraid to take a stand for God. We need to stand with God and His Word. No matter what you hear from people of this world who want you to believe that following the Bible is a lost cause. I've heard it said that way. Kind of get your blood pressure up. Kind of get you aggravated. Kind of get you on fire. Sometimes it makes us want to say things we shouldn't say. But you know, we have a passion for God. And we're going to stand true for Him and you're going to get excited. But if you feel like at any time that that excitement's going out, get back in your Bible. Get back in God's Word. Look at all He's done for us. Look at all the knowledge we can gain from this Bible. The Bible's, what, a great GPS. It is a great rule book. And it's full of great life stories that will guide us through everything that we go through day in, day out. There is an answer for everything in that book. Everything. And if you give people enough time, maybe one of these days, <laughs> maybe one of these days they'll catch up with the Bible because they're so far behind. And remember what I said, the difference between science and the Bible is because they don't understand either. They don't understand either. But if you read your Bible and you learn to understand why God gave us all this is because He loves us. He loves us. God's not here to see us suffer or go through life just lost. He didn't put us here for that. If you remember, God put us here to disciple, to love one another, and bring others to know Him. Witness for Him. Don't be ashamed that you're a Christian. Display that you're a Christian. I find it just very, very warming when I go into a place and I bow my head to pray over the food that I'm about to eat with my family or with my friends or just by myself. You'd be amazed at the people that walk up to you and say, I don't see that anymore. I don't see that much anymore going on. I'm proud you're doing that. But what will make you prouder is when that grandchild says, let me be the one to pray today. Boy, didn't that just tear your heart out and you go, you know, maybe I need to continue following what the Bible says because my grandchildren are getting it now. Be the example. If a historian... Or a scientist has a good word to say about the Bible. It shouldn't give you any more faith in the Bible at all. Just a little more faith in the scientist and the historian, right? Because the Bible has and will continue to stand the test of time. God's word's true. Many of you deal with this every day, that you're, you're either going to work or you're, going, you're probably just meeting with some of your family members as I was. And you're running into people all the time that just really don't want to get on board. And you can't force them to get on board. You can't force them to read the Bible. You can't force them to believe in the Bible. You can't force them to do any of that. 
But you can expose them to it. You can be the one that introduces them to Christ. And you may not do it right at that minute, but you might be the one that plants the seed that it happens down the road. We should all be gardeners. And we should all be planting those seeds. Because once again, we may not change the whole world, but we can sure change our little piece of it. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you, Father God, for the continued rain that uh, we prayed about. Father, that's going to nourish our land and crops. Father, we thank you for each and every one here today that uh, they took the time this morning to get up and come spend time with you. We thank you for your spirit and your presence sitting here among us. Father, I pray that we continue to take that stand and be a witness for you. That we wouldn't walk away from a situation when someone wants to deny that you exist or your word is true. That we would be the one to back it up with your word, Father God. Because you tell us if we can back it with your scripture, then no one can, can counter that. Father, let us just walk in faith and let us be the ones that step out in front. Let us be bold. Father, and let us plant those seeds that are going to bring someone to know you better. Father, we ask that you continue to uh, be with us. We thank you for the favor you show on your church house. We thank you for the favor that you show on your church family here. Father, I pray you continue to keep us tight, that you keep us focused on what you would have us do and where you'd have us go. Father, we just thank you for this opportunity to be free and come here to worship you and be part of what you want us to be. Father, we give it all to you. We hope that everything we said and did here today was glorifying, uplifting to you. And we ask all this in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen.